come down to the fundamental. It goes down to the fundamental question of um, if, if if I'm struggling in school, how do I access support? Um, if I'm if I'm a family member who won't want to understand how my child um, can get extra support, wh wh where where are the resources that are available to me? And so I think hopefully you get some of those kind of questions answered tonight. Um, so one thing I want to go ahead and start off right away is. Um, Kind of just think about the, a little bit of the history of, of, of student support. Um, I'm, I've been around education long enough where I've actually gone through each of these kind of phases. So I started off in special education, where we basically, um, special education for a long time was the only way you can get kind of extra help. Um, aside from maybe teacher staying after school to work on homework, or maybe you know you might have access to a tutor. Um, the really only way for a student to get consistent targeted support at school was if they had to be found eligible with, with an educational disability. Um, and so I think with that being um, the only path, many kids were inappropriately identified because people wanted to, people had the best intentions, people wanted to get them help, but many times we had students that were struggling in our room. And in this model on the old, the, the special education child study model, it's kind of a deficit model. It, it, kind, of, it kind of assumes that something is wrong with the child. And therefore, that child needs to be quote unquote fixed. Um, it could be that um, the child was struggling to be in a room because they were hungry, they were homeless, they were they deal they're dealing with some mental health issues. But for us, it was always like, but it has to be student focused. It has to be something wrong. It wasn't anything wrong that the school the school was doing, um, even though we knew historically that we had had disproportionate representation of, of black and brown students in special education and also um, involved with student discipline as well. And so. Those things kind of would lead you, lead you to think maybe it's not completely a student issue. So, in an attempt to remedy that, you to give people some additional um, area of support without necessarily labeling a child um, with a special education disability. And again, many students are very appropriately identified and then needing the time as a special education. But we know a number of students could probably just need some, some quick targeted support and then they'd be back kind of achieving the same levels as their, as their classmates. So this new initiative came along called Response to Intervention. And so what that was, they said is we're gonna set up an intervention system in our school. So once you're identifying you as having an issue that you're not achieving at the level of your classmates, we're gonna give you targeted um, support. And so, we're, and then we're gonna see, hopefully that you we give you this targeted intensive support, you respond to that. You just, it could be that you just need a little bit extra instruction on top of the core instruction everybody else got. But again, with this model too, it was, it was still kind of focused on the fact that something is wrong with the student, they need to be helped. Um, and we have to kind of wait for them to be struggling really badly until they quote unquote qualified to be um, in the RTI process response to intervention. And so again, it was better than the old system of just child study because you could be in the general education system and get that support. But many kids, were, we were missing many kids and many kids were needlessly struggling um, because again, we had, it, we had this wait to fail system. So then, we're kind of evolved to this new system that in, in a very generic sense is called multi-tiered systems of support. Um, where the emphasis is on systems, I, that is, what do the adults do? And also the child. And so um, much rather than just focusing on, okay, a student is really, really struggling for, for, um, for multi-tiered system of support. And we'll be talking about the Virginia tier system of support up tonight. Um, the focus on prevention um, as much as it is intervention. And so we're going to talk about things in, I talk about tiers and domains, okay? So let me start off where here are our domains, meaning um, that these are all the areas within our school system where someone can get additional levels of support um, if, they, if they needed it. Um, well, what we've also come to realize, especially over the last four or five years, as we've had like a mental health crisis in our community, not just in our community, nationwide, these systems of support need to um, exist for the adults in our school as well. Um, and so, with, it's not just a student focus, it's systems of support serving both students and adults. And so many school divisions just did literacy and mathematics. Um, we were um, one of the first in the state of Virginia to actually include mental wellness, student and family engagement and positive school culture. Positive school culture um, needed, used to be labeled behavior. And again, behavior is also kind of a bit of that deficit model. It's like, oh, there's something wrong with the kid's behavior. Um, has nothing to do with the fact that I have a teacher demanding compliance and, uh, according to their own rules, and that's why the student might be successful. And so we think a much more positive formulation of that is positive school culture, uh, where the students, the staff, the community all work together to create an environment that everyone feels connected and a community of, of safety. Um, and so 
those are our five domains in which um, a student could both get in that initial first instruction. Um, and really anything that happens in this in the school setting comes under like this uh, this tiered system. So we have the, those five domains and each of these five domains, we have tiers. And so that obviously that's where the tier system support name comes from, where tier one is what we do for all kids. Um, tier one is what we do for all kids. It's what, how we support all our adults. Um, and, and we've expanded that here in Charlottesville with a, a lot of Bianca's leadership. Um, is and what do we do for those families who are struggling to connect to our school? What barriers are there in, that are in place that we need to try to eliminate um, for some? And then what who needs more extensive help? And that'd be so it goes from tier two targeting to, you know, we have representatives of these things I'm going to get into, but tier two is targeted for some people who just need additional more support on top of the core instruction. And then tier three is the intensive individualized support for those students who and students and or adults who are really struggling and need a very kind of um, very targeted support. So look, with this kind of system, it's a different kind of system from the old child deficit model. Like before we used to ask, we give a child a test, did they do well? Great, if they didn't, well, then we need to fix them. And this is a little different look at how we look at data. So what we need to look at is, in, in, from a school-based standpoint is look at the health of those tiers. When we're gonna talk about percentages. 80% of the students should be meeting benchmarks if we're doing our job at tier one. Um, that, that's the theory. And again, all, all schools are different. We have different kind of cohorts of kids. But generally speaking, we want to build a system where what we do should work for 80 to 85 percent of the kids. Um, some kids just need a bit more support, a little bit more targeted to maybe rather than a whole classroom approach, maybe a small group approach in addition to the whole classroom. That'd be tier two. Um, and are those individuals we're doing working? When I'm going to give the example of um, a little later that how sometimes those interventions could be the wrong interventions. We also need to think, so we need to think all those things have to be looked at before we assume the deficit is with the child. Um, we want to make sure that we look alongside, align multidisciplinary examination data, meaning if a student is struggling with their mental health, or they're struggling with their behavior, they're struggling in math, okay, which, based on all the evidence we have, based on all the data we can get, based on the family input, teacher input, where should we intervene first? Because we, we know we can't do everything because that's frankly overwhelming for the student. We need to kind of be able to triage, okay, you know what? I think this is the, the, the biggest barrier right now. We're gonna focus on this. You know, again, if a student is homeless, the fact that um, they're, they're, they're not achieving what they should be at the reading, the, our first answer should not be load them up in reading intervention. Our, our first answer is let's try to make sure their basic human needs are being met. So then maybe we can position eventually they'll be able to receive that instruction and achieve reading. But once we decide where we're going to kind of go ahead and focus our, our intervention, drill down to a particular area. Okay, we're going to focus on reading. Okay, where in reading? We're going to focus on behavior. Why do we think we're seeing the behavior we're seeing? Um, and then we always want to be asking the question, is this a system issue or is this a kid issue? Um, for, for too long, many times, we we've, we've, we've blamed the kid and saying, the reason why you're not succeeding in the system we have set up is because of, of, of a deficit on your part. Well, many times is the system we set up wasn't the best system. Um, and of course, this is of course um, led to historic inequities, um, both in achievement and discipline and exclusionary practices that we're still fighting and trying to tear down the, um, the systems that don't work and build new and better systems. Um, and so the, this VTSS approach, Virginia Tier System of Support, it's really different than the others because it's prevention based. The idea is that we really want to focus on that tier one, that universe of what we do for all kids, and then try to identify support as early as possible. We don't need to wait until someone's saying, you know what, they're failing, but not really failing enough for us to give them intervention. We want to be able to say, okay, if, if, you, if they're struggling in just the whole classroom, but maybe they just need a little extra support, let's bring some support to the teacher. So rather than maybe teaching 25 kids, they're teaching 15 and 10 kids are getting more targeted support. Maybe that's what needs to happen for that child to be successful. We, we, we do these practices where we, we think they're, they're, um, they're needed and appropriate. And then we have to look at it. Is what we're doing working? If I have a great reading program, I'm saying, you know what, I'm going to give every kid um, that, that's struggling in school an access to our reading program. And if they don't even have a reading issue, we're not going to say, well, since they, they didn't respond to the reading program, this kid is, um, is obviously failing. And like, well, no, actually, we're doing the wrong thing. And so having a system to be able to sit back and take a look at that. We're able to prevent new problems, reducing them transition challenges. And then again, if we meet their needs proactively, then, if, then again, many of our students come with significant kind of either 
this, they're, they're bringing into um, into when they walk through our school doors. They're, they're bringing some challenges, but if, if we're able to be preventative and proactive as possible, fewer of those kids will have um, have will have more and they'll, they'll hopefully they'll have less and less intense needs, and those needs will kind of ebb themselves less frequently. All right, so let's kind of go through each of the tiers and just the idea behind them here. So tier one is again, and every everyone who walks into our school and there's class schedule, that is tier one. Tier one is what are those supports we have in place for all staff? Um, how do we treat all families? That's all tier one. And so again, effective tier one is 80%, at least 80% of people meeting benchmarks. Well, then you say, well, does tier one look the same from school to school? And no, perhaps not. I mean, you have some one school where kids are exposed to lots and lots of language. They come in, the kindergarten come in, and you have you have 85 to 90 percent of them all reading, already reading at a, a grade level at benchmark. Well, well, that's great. You might have another school where maybe they weren't exposed to language, and it's not it's really deficit their own. It was just a you know, lack of exposure. They might only have 50 percent of people reading benchmark. And so for us, the answer is well, let's pick pick those 50 percent of kids who are not in the benchmark. Let's put them in interventions. Like no, no, no. We need to be more support to tier one. So again, so we can kind of get them caught up. We don't think there's really any real deficit in them. They just haven't been exposed to enough targeted or good instruction. So let's give that to them and let's help the teacher do that. We're not just gonna put that on teacher saying, well, by the way, just work twice as hard as you're working before. No, we wanna bring those supports to the teacher. And then, and then we determine, are we, are we taking the data? Are, is what we're doing working? If that didn't work, we would go on just to go on tier two. And tier two, hopefully it's 20% or less. We usually talk about, um, more like 10 to 15 percent, ideally for tier two, um, and, and this is in addition to the core instruction. So we don't want to be pulling kids from core instruction um, just to go ahead and 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 get them intervention because that just puts them further behind. So we have to have a. So this is also comes down to schedule. When during the school day can they both get their core instruction, but at the same time have that extra time for the more targeted specific intervention. And so that's a lot. That's challenged us to figure out what does our school day look like. Um, within our subjects, do we have like a, a two hour reading block? Okay, is it an hour and a half? Is that core instruction? And is 30% intervention for the kids that need that? And maybe in, enrichment for the kids who, who, who are already reading benchmark and we want to push further. We don't want to help them. We don't want to hold them behind. Virginia to your system of support supports those students as well. And so we also want to be kind of considering the fact that, again, is what we're doing, here we go. Um, is what we're doing working? Um, that is the intervention itself um, being affected. It should work to 70% of the kids that their gap is closing, that they're, we're looking to impact the rate of learning. Um, and we do that by giving them both their core instruction and additional targeted um, instruction. And so if, if we, we should know that the intervention itself needs to be at least 70 to 80% um, effective with the students they're working with. And we wanna make sure that we're asking these questions. And then finally, the last tier, tier three. So this is, again, I did zero to 5% of students need this intensive individualized instruction. Um, and again, we have to be thinking, okay, are, and, and again, for, for, for um, we're gonna talk a little bit later about mental health and mental wellness. Um, mental wellness is kind of what we're gonna talk about, what we, what we all want to have, those social emotional strengths and competencies that make us effective, um, safe and healthy human beings. Once we get into tier three, we're talking about okay, potential issues with mental health that are really preventing people from being um, successful in the classroom setting. And again, we want to make sure that um, we're asking these questions and, because this is not a, a kind of a, a sentence like, okay, once you come to the kindergarten, you're labeled, you're labeled that for life. It's all a, a kind of at this point in time thing. Um, it's where they are in the people's domain. We have many students who come in who might have, a, in, and they might have um, a, a, a cognitive deficit for reading. But because their parents, you know, have given them tons of um, read to them every night, given tons of language, they might go get by just fine in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, things are going fine. But then third and fourth grade come, and all of a sudden the content is coming faster and faster. The, the subject matters are going deeper and deeper, and then finally they can't compensate for that deficit anymore. And then maybe the student who was doing great at kindergarten, first and second, may start struggling. I'm um, now they're getting the third and fourth grade. Another student may, may be struggling socially, and that's why at a given point in time, they might, they might, and so we want to be, we want our system to be flexible enough to meet them where they need it at the time that they need it. Um, so we, so it's it hopefully, if we're setting it up right, it's a fluid thing. We're constantly looking, is what we're doing working? How are they functioning? We always want to move the students back down, and, and again, to give them, make sure that 
they're getting as much of the full school experience as they possibly can, that if they don't need intervention, they're not just keeping there just because we feel safe about that. We're, we're doing a better job at, at meeting their needs in tier one. So for all those different, those are, a lot of times we have those academic conversations, but we also have a lot of non-academic things that we do in our schools now. Um, and so this is a list of some really great initiatives that we have in our school. Um, so we talk about issues like equity, the need to be trauma responsive. There's a number of different programs, including BTSS, um, that these are all happening in our schools. And for many of our, stu for many of our students, and, and more importantly, for our staff, it can be frankly overwhelming. It's like, wait, I'm supposed to teach third grade and know how to do all these things? You know, I just need clarity. I need to figure out how all this stuff works together. Um, I need to know what each of these things mean. And I need to have the capacity to both do my job and to be able to kind of sprinkle these in as I need to. Um, and so for us, we've had to kind of take a little step back and think, you know what? Okay, those things are not the end. Those are the means to the end. These things are the end. This is what we're going for for all our students, for all our staff. We want to improve adult and student social emotional competencies. And it gives them, I talk about, not, I'm not talking about just skills. And what, what do I mean by, well, I'll get into later about what I mean by the competencies. Um, uh, but again, it's competencies, not skills. And I'll tell you the difference of that in a second. Creating and sustaining safe and equitable school environments, intentionally building connected communities. These things have always existed in pockets in our schools. Sometimes we have schools where there's a lot of those pockets. Sometimes we have schools where there's only a couple of those pockets. And it's really, it many times it would depend on either a building leader or a teacher leader. Like if you, your child happened to go into that school or happened to go into that classroom where these things existed, they had a great um, learning experience. Unfortunately, if your child went through um, a, a building or a classroom where these things were in place, they did not have the same experience. And again, that's just the issue of equity right there. Um, and so for us, we want to raise the floor so that all of our students are getting access to these main three focus areas. So again, looking at how do all these things work together, um, that when we're doing it right, we're doing this all, um, doing a great job at all five of these areas for tier one in a preventative way, but if students need support or adults need more support, we have things in place to get them to where they want to go. Um, and then that need again for the multidisciplinary lens that I need to be thinking not in terms of just um, of, of literacy or math or just behavior. Um, an example I can give that when I was in special education, um, we had a student who was really struggling reading and most of the schools, and this is this is a while ago, this is about 10 years ago, most of that school's intervention setup was about reading. Um, they said, no, reading, will, reading intervention will solve everything. Um, and so this child went into reading intervention. So we started tier two, met two or three times a week with the reading specialist and a group of like, you know, five to seven, still didn't do very well. And so, you know what, we need to bump this up. We need to go to tier three. And so then that was meeting every single day in a group of one to three for 30 minutes a day. And the students still struggled. And we're like, well, this, this child must have a reading disability. And so we went to special eligibility and we found out the kid had autism. We were just completely missed it um, because we, we were thinking just in a line of, oh, it's all about reading. We know we need to have that integrated multidisciplinary um, lens where we're able to say, okay, given all the, all the data we have, the different ways of looking at how a child could be successful, where do we think is the biggest barrier right now? How do we kind of triage and make sure we address that? So then, so all this can be very overwhelming for a parent. Okay, so then, how can, then as a parent, how can I kind of support this system? And so here's some key questions that you, you want to feel very comfortable asking your teacher in your school. Um, again, you can ask, is my child being successful? How do you know? I mean, are, are people who say, oh, your, your child is lovely and, and we just love having them. And like, yeah, but how are they doing? Are they progressing? Um, if they need it, how is that help being provided? What can I do to support my child with, with what's going on? And then how do I know if what these extra things either I'm doing at home or you're doing at school or they're working? These are all very legitimate questions to be asking. Um, and these are um, um, questions that frankly, our schools should be able to answer you. And if they don't, then you, you, you're you certainly within your rights and your prerogative to go say, I really need the answers to these things. Um, so then what do I do? If I really do believe my, my child is struggling, again, checking with your child's teacher. The most important relationship that a child has at a school is with their teacher. Um, again, that's that's especially true in the younger ages, but we're finding it's, it's, it's really additionally as true in middle and high school that they need to feel that connection with their teacher. Um, ask for progress reports, you know, help them kind of say, okay, you know, why do you think my child is struggling? And what kind of, what do I need to be doing at home to potentially help if I can? Um, if not, then how can we access some additional supports? Um, like I said, um, ask questions when there's no progress, select right when there's progress. 
And maybe uh, don't be afraid to make those, I'm gonna add, make that list of specific questions to ask about your child. So in real, real terms, okay, um, we had these teams of folks who, whose charge it is, is to kind of manage those tiers, say who needs to get your help and what will that extra help look like? So every school has at least one DTSS team. If you have questions about the, this process, these tiers of intervention that your child's, um, and your school that your child's teacher can't answer, your principal should know, I think your assistant principal know, they could also direct you um, to your arm, um, that there's a chairman of that team and they certainly would know the process very well and they can explain that, that process to you. Um, and it gives you, you have very big picture questions, but of course, that's Bianca and I are both available to answer those. It's more kind of abstract, not necessarily school specific questions, but like, hey, in general, how does this work? We of course are available to help and support you with that as well. So then what, what I want to spend a little bit of time talking now is, you know, in traditionally when we'll talk about short school, we'll talk about the academic domains, literacy and math, like, you know, science, social studies, history. Um, what we've really grown to discover, and sadly, especially so um, during the pandemic, is the impact of mental health and, um, and academic outcomes. That if a student is struggling with self-regulation, frequently they are not available for instruction. We can have the most amazing instruction, the highest engaging activities, and if, it's, and if a student is struggling with deep depression and, and or, you know, again, some basic needs are not getting met, okay, we will not have that academic achievement. And, we've, and so we've slowly kind of grown our resources and grown our capacity, especially here in Charlotte City Schools. Um, the school board and, and, and our division leadership has done an amazing job of increasing our capacity to, within our schools, not just to refer to the community, although our community partners are incredibly important, but within the schools themselves, we actually have more school mental health professionals to help address some of these, these issues here. So I mentioned before about social emotional learning and, and those social emotional competencies that we want adults and students to have. So what we mean by that? So these are, um, we, we based on this model, um, there's this a group out of Chicago called CASEL, and they, and they, they did kind of organize a, a social emotional learning on these five core areas, these four or five core competencies. Um, Self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision-making. These are important life skills that we want our kids to have, who we want ourselves to have. Um, and so, and we talk about these things in terms of competencies, not just skills, because competence is a skill I can learn in a given place, in a given environment with a given person. Um, but then I mean, I, I may go to some, another environment or another person and I can't, I can't use that skill, it's, it's, it, I, I can't access it. A competency is the ability to kind of take that skill and apply it to all different kinds of settings with all different kinds of people in all different kinds of environment. That's our higher goal that we want both for ourselves and obviously for our students as well. And because these things, again, will um, have a direct impact on how well a student does academically. The other piece of this, again, is looking at the adult um, social emotional competencies. Adults are building in self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, because that impacts how they socially interact with their students. And you can see on the right-hand side there where that may come out and, and, and evidence themselves. It also impacts their instructional interactions. Um, and so this, and again, this is a lesson that we've learned, especially over the last four or five years that we need to be taking care of our, our, our adults that um, almost as intentionally as we are our students because they need to be in, in place and be kind of, you know, kind of um, supportive enough for them so that they in turn can be a support for our students. And so these are all different ways they can play out um, in a very positive way or potentially in, in not as a constructive way. And we want to be very careful about that. Um, this is something that the research has shown um, that we know that our kids can't be well the adults are well. And so we need, and that's something that we've certainly learned, um, but I, I think we, we've learned that we need to be taken care of, not just say, you know, go ahead and take a walk, we need to take a walk. Be a lot more intentional, be a lot more kind of, don't put it on the adults to help them fix themselves. How can we be more supportive as a school system to do that? Here's just, I'm gonna give you a snapshot of this, just because you might hear some of these things happen at your school. Um, there's many things going on in our division. In Charlottesville, we are extremely lucky. We are a resource-rich environment. And again, like I showed before, it sometimes can be a little overwhelming. Um, and so that's why we try to drill down to those three areas. But these are all the many different things that are going on in our schools. Um, part of what we want to talk about social emotional too is, is just not kind of a standalone, oh, this is what we do in the morning, and then we don't discuss it all day long. Because it can have an impact in so many more ways um, than in, that initial explicit instruction in social emotional learning. Just like we instruct literacy, just like we instruct social studies, if we instruct in those skills of self management, self regulation, social awareness, self awareness, um, we can build and repair individual student social emotional competencies. Um, repair because some of us are having impacted by trauma. 
we have been impacted by by circumstance. And so it's not. So but what we've learned is that we can actually address and fix these things through through connectedness to a trusted adult and through explicit instruction and support. Then we and then just the kind of the developmental way we want to go there. The next piece is okay. Now I've, I have these companies myself. How do I use them in my community? How do I apply these skills? Just like we talk about in reading, where first we learn to read, then we read to learn. If I have these social emotional skills, how can I build and repair my immediate environment? And so for us, where we play that in our schools is restorative practices. How can we build and repair our local school community? Um, and again, I, I, we had an example about five or six years ago where there was a there was an incidence of bullying in the school where a kid got jumped. And then they brought all the kids back together and they said, oh, well, you know, don't you feel bad this person was hurt? I don't even know that person. Why would I feel bad about someone I don't know? And we talked about repairing community. There wasn't a community to repair in that circumstance. And that was a big light bulb moment in a very sad way that we need to have a um, build that community and then bring people back into that community, both the victim and the person perpetuating the harm. And so restorative practices have definitely become a real point of um, initiative in our schools. And finally, again, what, what do we all hope for all our students is that they, when they leave our schools, they have these skills, they know how to use them, they can build and repair a kind of the world around them. They can, they can kind of, they, they be a member of the greater Charlottesville community, the greater um, Virginia, the United States world community. And, and again, with hopefully the mindset of I can kind of build and repair because I have the skills to do so. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Um, and, and that's all kind of foundational piece of mental wellness. Another piece we talk about is, is in school setting, um, it's really important that we have um, common vision expectations of students um, for behavior and what we expect of them, both academically and behavior-wise. Consistency matters. We know that, that um, and again, I, I've, I, I'm a, one of the role, hats that I wear in our division is I support um, both schools and teachers and students who are maybe struggling with appropriate behavior. And so I want to have the opportunity to go into a school and follow a student throughout their day. That this was a student that had Buford. And it was emotionally exhausting for me as the adult to follow them through their seven period day because they went into seven completely different environments. Where seven completely, and again, this is about five or six years ago, about seven, seven completely different set expectations from their teachers, seven ways of speaking to students, seven, um, seven ways of tones of voice. And some of those environments felt welcoming and warm, so some felt cold and quiet. And so what we know is that we can have common language, common practices, that kind of makes things more predictable for our students. And then when they have that predictability, they're gonna feel a little bit safer. Um, and so whatever we do, and, and there's different schools that take um, different approaches. One approach that you might hear is called um, PBIS, Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports. Um, other terms you might hear, we talked about restorative justice. You might, your school might talk about responsive classroom. Whatever kind of program they use, these are the things that we want to be coming at it. Among the whole school, is there a common purpose and approach for this? Is there a clear set of positive expectations behavior? And do we teach those behaviors? If I if I if I've I'm if I've had a kindergarten running the hallway, I'm not gonna stop and yell at them in the hallway if I haven't taught them what is the appropriate way to walk in the hallway. Um, and so just like if a student doesn't um, read, we don't berate them that they don't know how to read, we teach them. And so we want to have this idea that discipline and behave positive behavior support is instructional. And um, so then how do we encourage expected behavior once we think they have the skills? What are some ways we can discourage the inappropriate behavior? And then how do we have classes for making sure is what we're doing working? Are our students kind of growing um, or, or, or are we kind of going backwards? So there's some things about like PBS, oh, that's just where you give people stickers all the time. But no, it's actually, it's teaching, modeling, practicing those appropriate behaviors and then very consistent, clear consequences of target behaviors that are hopefully not punitive, but saying that makes sense that, okay, you know, you ran around at recess and threw things at people. Maybe today, I mean, you, you kind of sit the first five minutes of recess. It, it was, again, I, I, don't, I can't trust you to be safe at recess. That's a clear consequence that's related to behavior that's hopefully instructional, saying, well, I really like recess. Maybe, maybe if, I, if I have the ability to regulate myself, I won't do that next time. Um, it's also about not I'm ignoring inappropriate behavior. A big part of PBS is there has to be, the full staff have to be kind of do the whole thing the same way. Um, and again, we, it, we talk about things like cell phones and, and, and hats and it's just that, it, it doesn't really matter what the rule is, we just need to be consistent in our approach to it because that consistency is predictability and then predictability of their safety. I mean, and then talk about, I'm, I'm, what I'm talking about safety there is emotional and social safety. That again, if, if, I don't, if I don't know what to expect, I'm constantly on edge. 
If I had a clear set of expectations, I know what the expectations are. I know what I'm walking into. I feel good about that. We have more information on our website about DTSS and social emotional learning. And so we're, those are a little dated. We're, we're going to be updating those this year because we've made a lot of changes. But there's, it just gives you some, paints a big kind of a broad outline of what that is. Um, these are things that we're working with our teachers on. That um, these are um, positive behavior classrooms, of course, that we want all of our teachers to know how to do. Um, and these are just, again, things that you wouldn't think. Many of our teachers do these things intuitively. They just kind of walk in the door, oh, that makes sense to do that. That I'm going to arrange my classroom. So if I'm bending down helping the students, I don't have my back to half the room. Um, something like that <laughs> can, can be very preventative and um, making sure that people are maintaining appropriate behavior. Um, am I doing active supervision? Am I scanning the room? I, am I saying if someone's doing something well, I really like how you put your pencil away versus good job. Good job doesn't really teach them that. It just it just sounds nice. Um, and then all these other kind of different um, things that we that will both help students behaviorally and, and positive support, but also helps them academically as well. And we want our teachers to feel confident in these different strategies. Um, and so we kind of into that is, is we think of how we do discipline. Like I was saying before, the student um, lacks fluency. We, we assume they're trying, but they just need some more support. Social behavior, we can't say, oh, you know, you're making a choice to behave that way. We, we really want to get on the mindset that discipline is instructional. Because historically, what the reason um, that how, what it was had resulted is, again, this is true, has been true in Charlotte, it's been true in Virginia, it's been true around the country. We talk about things like the decodes. Um, a student is sent to the office for being disruptive, defiant, disrespect. Those are very subjective terms. And many times um, that comes between the clash of cultures between the teachers and the, teachers and the students. But historically, that was trained as this is what the student is doing wrong. Um, and so for us, we need to kind of, again, hopefully really get rid of those terms and you know have some things that are very observable um, and then work on those ideas of the clash of cultures. So we talk about having cultural competency in teachers, talk about implicit bias, social justice, anti-racism, and all those types of things there. Um, so, so additional support. So again, I, I mentioned before that, um, that I'm the Division of DTSS coordinator, Bianca, um, aside from being a student family engagement specialist, is also one of our systems coaches. So Bianca is one of our division experts. And each of your schools, again, your school admin, and they have a, they have a point of contact and a department chair, all of whom are very knowledgeable about BTSS and how does, what does that system mean and look like in your school and how can that potentially support your child? Uh, and they're gonna, and they, we're all available to answer the questions you might have. So at that point, I will stop sharing my screen and start talking. Um, and if anybody has any questions or comments, um, 